Good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Manico. I'm uh, the VP of Security Architecture for White Hat. I'm one of the board members for the OWASP Foundation. And uh, I, I run the Cheat Sheet series at OWASP, which is really important for developers. It's a, a bunch of small, concise guides on how to write secure code based on various threats and controls that we need to deal with in our, in our work. Now, before I really get started, though, I'm really curious about you, who are you? So let's go around the room real quick. We have a lot of people here, so let's move. Please tell me your name and what language you do or what your major is. Give me a really short blip about what technology. Here, I'll start. Jim Manico, I'm into secure coding and crypto, and I focus mostly on Java and PHP. So let's, let's go around the room fast and do that. Are you with me? Yes. Oh, come on, are you with me? Yes. Go. So you have before you a giant collection of PhD and practical level application security thinkers. This is one of the greatest collections of, of security, application security thinkers I've ever seen in one room. The more you talk to each other and share your stories, in addition to attending these different tracks, the better. So learn, talk to each other, learn from each other. This is a great collection of very intelligent minds in the world of application security. Let's get to it. So we know how big of a problem cybercrime is. We're seeing losses anywhere from 110 to 338 billion US dollars yearly, depending on your perspective. If you look at just direct financial loss from cybercrime, Symantec says it's about 110 billion a year globally. And if you count downtime for denial of service, that number leaps up to 338 billion. And we're spending about a trillion dollars a year protecting against cybercrime. This is big money, and when big money happens, a lot more attention is put onto this topic. So those of us who've been in application security for a long time, who cared about this 10 years ago? Frank, who cared about application and software security 10 years ago? Yeah, very, very few people. What about today, though? How, how much do you hear about the topic of software security today? I see it on the front page of major newspapers. Almost every university has now a web security or software security program. Big money, big problems, but we have big solutions on the way. And those of you PhD students, you're the, the future. You're the hope for this world to be able to lock down software in a secure fashion. You'll be teaching the next generation about this. So jokes aside, I applaud you for your work. Keep it up. So what's the problem here? Why is software security such a difficult problem to solve? Problem number one is that it's an asymmetric arms race. What I mean by this is the resources that an attacker needs to do damage is, yeah, the resources an attacker needs to really hurt you through your software is much, much less than the defenses needed to stop the problem. Let's go back to numbers for a second. Again, almost a trillion dollars were spent defending and the damage, to, we're spending about a trillion a year to defend 338 billion worth of damage and how good are we doing in general? Even with this level of defense, we're still losing terribly. So we're outspending the attackers by a huge amount but we're still losing. So asymmetric arms race. Let's look at it a different way. So this is an inconvenient truth. So you as developers, you spend 10 years, 10 man years of, of your resources to build a complex piece of enterprise software. Business logic, security errors, code flaws, deployment errors. You roll back to an earlier insecure version because of a functionality bug. It's, it's a huge problem, a huge amount of resources needed to even build software that's very complex, let alone make it secure. And what are we doing to check if this is being done correctly? Yeah, let's do two weeks of ethical hacking to try to review this. That's not working. This is a joke. No offense to the breakers, but this two weeks of ethical hacking is not going to solve the problem of the complexity of modern software. And here's another inconvenient truth. So here's your SDLC, right? Your software development life cycle. Now, software development life cycle is important, but here's, the, here's our software life cycle. We schedule a pen test. We schedule a pen test, we do some kind of review. Well, here's the attacker's software development life cycle. I hack you all day. 
So does this work? This is what we do in the industry, but this is what the attackers do in the real world. Who has the edge? The attackers, by far. We need something different here. Also, you are what you eat. What do we eat? Who are we when we build software? We're this. We have subcontractors, outsourced development, third-party APIs, third-party components and services that we depend upon, commercial off-the-shelf software and components, outsourced development, close in-house in consultants, and our code. So this, this, is, this is what you're eating right now. You are what you eat. And you know, how many insecurities do we see throughout this software chain? It's pretty dramatic. So here's a 2012 study of 31 popular open source libraries that software developers use in their day-to-day -day work. So of, of about, tw about 20 million downloads of third-party libraries, 26% um, have known exploitable vulnerabilities. Today's applications use up to 30 or more libraries. And if you look at all the code that makes up a complicated piece of Java software, about 80% of it is your third-party code, like your Xerxes libraries and your, your iTex libraries that you use for PDF rendering. All of that matters. And here's just a, a glimpse into that world. So we see the Spring application framework has been downloaded about 18 million times by about 43,000 organizations using the Java Spring framework. Who here uses Java Spring? It's a very popular framework. And so we see huge information leakage and other problems in Spring that have gone unfixed for huge amounts of time. It makes it easy for an attacker to understand the depths of how you're configuring Spring. Or how about Apache CFX? 4.2 million downloads. Frank, what's an auth bypass? What's that? Ac it, so we have the Apache CFX application. How damaging is an, authentic is an authorization bypass? You're done. So we have these major bugs in third-party components that we, that we depend upon very significantly. And do we test for these issues? How many of you are uh, looking at the source code of your third-party libraries and analyzing them at each step within your life cycle before using it? Anybody? I'm not. Anybody? Guess how many major corporations do this? Very few. And yet, that's 80% of your code base. So again, asymmetric warfare. You are what you eat. And what are you eating? You're eating radically insecure third-party code and depending on it, not even to mention the code that you're writing. And what do your managers tell you? Do your manager, who, who here is writing code professionally right now? And so I'll pick on you. So does your boss say, look, what, what's your name again? Bart. Bart. So does your, does your boss say, Bart? I want you to be relaxed. I want you to take your time. Really work on that code until you're sure it's secure, and then we'll go to release. Do you ever hear that? What is, and what, is, what does your boss say about you being here this week? What should you be doing this week? What? Coding at night? <laughs> That's the world we live in. And I don't want to blame your boss. That's just the world we live in. We're getting pushed to build code fast. And so, you know, one CISO, 10 business units, 30 security staff, 200 web applications, 1,000 web servers, 2,000 databases, 100,000 individual client records. This is a small company now. And untold millions of potential hackers. This is what we're up against and we're losing. And imagine you're doing security activity for 1,000 web apps. There are millions of companies who have thousands of web apps. So you have a thousand annual pen tests and hundreds of different penetration testers, that knowledge comes and goes, a thousand plus reports. How do we consume this data in an intelligent way? And the answer is we do not overall. Also, now we want to fix the problem, so we want to inform developers about this problem. And so there's compliance. This is real compliance. If you're not paying attention to this, I mean, you've got to have your eye on this. New EU laws, Article 23, 24, and 27 of this EU directive says, the supervisory authority shall impose a fine of up to 250,000 euros, or in the case of an enterprise, up to 0.5% of your annual worldwide gross. 
to anyone who intentionally or negligently does not protect personal data. So I think SQL injection is something that if you don't protect against, you're being negligent. It's easy to fix SQL injection. Can you imagine having a multi-billion dollar banking organization and having the EU authority show up and take away 0.5% of your gross because one of your developers didn't fix SQL injection? You better pay attention to this kind of compliance. This, is, this matters. Here's another kind of a compliance that developers have to deal with. All right, who's hacking my wireless? Who's doing it? All right. How about we had two people in the United States arrested for trying to bring uh, Kinder eggs into the United States. Anybody here know what Kinder eggs are? It's a little chocolate egg with a toy inside, right? Well, we had two individuals coming in from Canada who had like six Kinder eggs with them to bring to their kids in the US to have a piece of chocolate with a toy inside is not legal. We worry about kids choking because, you know, we're Americans, we're foolish. But anyways, um, uh, and so there's foolishness everywhere, I'm just kidding. So, so we have kin guys getting kin arrested for Kinder Eggs. You know what the guys did when they were being arrested? They were told that they couldn't do this. They started laughing in the authorities' face because they thought they were being joked. So we put this kind of compliance onto developers as well. Things like earlier versions of PCI were a joke. And so we're, it's all getting better. So you gotta be really careful about how we communicate these things to developers. So let's sum up, let's get into the, let's dig deeper and get into real technology now. We've set the scene, but let's dig deeper. What are we protecting against? What are the real threats? Threat modeling is crucial here. We have John Steven um, doing some threat modeling and all the work that I know Ken does, he's always bringing threat modeling into the, into the scene. So good conversations to have, good sections to go to today. A penetration test alone, no doubt about it, it's a losing battle. And so we need something uh, better than, I'm not saying a pen test is bad, just by itself, if that's your security program, it doesn't solve the problem. We need more than just a pen test. And here's the crucial question. When building new software, you just try to do your best to write secure code. What about legacy problems? What if you're going back to fix older insecure software? What do we fix first? That's a very difficult question. We have limited resources. Where do we spend those resources in trying to secure software? I've seen many companies spend a million dollars to fix a small bug and spend no money to fix easy bugs. So again, I don't think anyone has this figured out well. A lot of people say, well, just do risk analysis and do risk measurement. How good of a science is risk analysis in, in security these days? CISOs, so risk analysis, what do you think? I agree. I, I think it's a, we have a, a very long history of risk analysis in just the field of mathematics, and especially in information security, we barely use any of that. We use a, a quick little risk kind of grading, you know, impact times likelihood. We call that risk analysis in math and we move on. That's not risk analysis. Go talk to a bank's, or, or go, go talk to an insurance agency's uh, mathematicians and financial advisors. They're doing real risk analysis and they still fail. Those of us in security are not. So I mean that in a respectful way. Also, if you're gonna to talk to developers, you better speak in dev speak. I've seen many security professionals who are good hackers try to explain this to a developer and fail because we're trying to bring developers into the world of security. That doesn't work. We as security professionals, we need to enter the world of development. That's a much more powerful movement as, a, as an organization. And also start early, design securely. But let's get to it. Let's dig into real security now. First of all, we have a get and a post request. This is the most important protocol you're going to work with in the world of web development. What's more secure, a get or a post for submission of sensitive data? Pardon me? So I, a post is more secure. Let's take it to the next level, Thomas. An HTTP post, is that a good way to send sensitive data? It's just better than get. Is a, listen to my words really carefully. Is an HTTP post, HTTP. I know, but it's not, it's not secure, and I always say it's better than get. I, I respectfully conject it's the Get has all these problems of post and more. I'm missing one letter here. S. Thank you. 
So the best way to submit sensitive data over the web is an HTTPS post. That should be the only way you submit sensitive data over the web. And even then, things like the previous URL you were on can leak. Here we are making a, we're, we're making a, 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 a request, we're making a, a request, a get request, a relative one to the search API. And uh, we see we're leaking the refer. We're leaking the previous URL that they were on. And they tried to log in in this last one. And so here they tried to log in and they're leaking their username and password because they were trying to log in over a get request. Those of you who are keeping track, the most important uh, the rule number one of secure web coding, here's the negative rule. The negative rule is never submit sensitive data over a get request. It leaks, leaks in refer headers, it leaks over a, a browser history, it leaks in proxy servers. Here's the positive rule, only submit sensitive data over an HTTPS post request where your sensitive data is not in the URL bar because you can do a, we have a post request that still has a query string in it. And uh, here we go. We have an HTTP, yeah, we have a, a post with a query string in it. So you want to make sure that when you're doing a secure post, you keep the data in the payload, in the actual form. That's just secure coding rule number one. Let's move on here. Injection flaws. The whole class of injection, that's one of the most dangerous class of vulnerabilities in, a, in any kind of application, especially server-side applications. They're very easy to exploit. They're uh, very easy to do a great deal of damage to that application or data. It's very, very easy to fix. So what kind of attack are we looking at right now? Breakers. All right, Mr. Hacker, are you ready? What kind of attack is this? Simple SQL injection. We hear a lot of people in the media talking about APT, right? Oh no, APT, advanced persistent threat of all these advanced attack agents and they're gonna beat us up and they're gonna steal our data and they're magic, they'll jump over our firewalls and nothing we can do will stop them and it's in the newspaper, it's this big thing. Well, I see your APT and I raise you single quote semicolon. That's my AP, that's APT alone. So let's look at this simple attack, two characters. It takes two characters to take down a major organization or less. Let's decompose this. So we have a basic SQL injection attack here where the feature is let's edit an email address, like a user profile, edit user profile. And so we take the email from the request we take the user ID from the request and we build a simple query. Update the users table, set the email address to be the new email address where the user ID is the hidden user ID as a hidden variable. Really standard, simple web development. Cool? So let's APT, let's, let's attack this. And again, my APT, single quote, semicolon. We'll call that APT number seven. Oops. I think my APT jokes are hilarious. Just, you can laugh. I'll, I'll remind you when to laugh. And so here we have the attack now. The attack, super awesome APT hack, single quote, semicolon. This gets injected into the new email, and now the query is built. Update user, set email is, single quote, another single quote, semicolon, single quote. So this is the final query that gets executed against the backend database update user table, set all email to be an empty string. So that simple single quote semicolon through a simple query ends up injecting to the point where it wipes out the entire email address field for the entire database. And this, in most web applications, it's game over. That application stops working. We need to email users through proper workflow of most major applications. So I'm still worried about this. I don't care about APT. They're one of many threat actors in the world right now. I don't worry about who the attackers are. I worry about, because there are a lot of attackers out there. I worry about what do we need to do to stop these vulnerabilities in code? And you're probably thinking, wow, Jim, this is so interesting and fun. How can we make this morning even more fun? That's a good question, Bart. So the answer is, let's do some code review. Don't you agree? There's nothing more fun in a Monday morning than some group code review. Are you with me, Frank? 
<laughs> He's like, I look forward to it. All right. <laughs> so let's take a look at, at some basic code here. We have a, this is meta code, you know, .NET ish code. We have select star from the user table where the username is some string, the username, and the password is the request password. So what is this? This is a simple login form, username and password login form. And so what the developer did not intend are parameters like this. The username is John, and the password's blah, single quote, or one equals one, with no single quote on the end. So this input goes in, we put it in where the password was expected, and what happens now? So we add an or one equals one clause, which makes this query always return true. And as the attacker, we no longer need the password. We just need the username, and we can log in as any account. This is very, this is very classic uh, SQL injection that's used to do authentication bypass. So here's another chunk of code. Let's just get right to it here. We have, some, we have the actual sync where the attack is happening. Select star from the user table where the name is some input. So we're doing a yeah, simple select from the user table on some username, simple stuff. And so how do we know this is really a dangerous attack? We look at the source. So here's where the source, here's the input where that we're grabbing the name from the request. This is now untrusted data, data that can be changed to be anything because it's untrusted. And then that untrusted data is added to a query using string concatenation. This is the heart of all injection. This is the heart of SQL injection, command injection, and even cross-site scripting, which is just JavaScript injection. So we can even have SQL injection when using stored procedures. I've seen a lot of smart people say, if you're using a stored procedure, SQL injection goes away. This is not true at all. And so here's an example of uh, an exec statement. They're executing a, st a, sel a select statement and they're just putting the uh, untrusted data back in again. Or we have an example of a stored procedure, and underneath the hood of that stored procedure, they're doing the same kind of string building. So you need to actually implement your stored procedure safely. And uh, you, you need to actually do parameterization when you're building SQL, when you're calling a stored procedure, and inside the stored procedure itself. So how damaging can this be? The right SQL injection vulnerability can lead to complete takeover of a server. We had different OWASP speakers back around 2009 using techniques like this to you know, bit shifting techniques in some places where they could literally use SQL injection to get root GUI access to the database server after multiple tiers of attacks using techniques like this. And so the answer is, P is, uh, the answer is query parameterization. Who's heard of query parameterization before? Those, so most people here. So those of you in software security, this is the most important technique in all of secure coding. It's critical that we all master it. All of us need to master this. And PHP, by far, is the most popular language that drives the web, by far. What do you think of PHP? What, right, we're computer scientists, right? What's the trade-off with PHP? It's a super easy language to learn. It's very unstructured. You can just start writing with it right away. But the downside is a lot of people write very sloppy, hard to maintain PHP. And those of us who use Java, because it's object-oriented, we, we always write perfect Java, right? <laughs> just kidding. And so this is one of the most important defensive techniques there is, period. This is using the PHP PDO database access library and its query parameterization that completely stops SQL injection. Now, underneath the hood of this, they're doing escaping and encoding to make sure untrusted input is always going to be data and not metadata that drives the query. So this is a really simple technique. You even get some performance bumps when you do this as well. So if you are in a major organization and you can't write code this way, give up now. It's game over. So very often when I approach a large company who's approaching software security for the first time, I like to say, let's stop all SQL injection across all applications first, and then we'll work on everything else. Because this will let us touch every piece of code, touch every team who's working on code, reduce the biggest risk to our organization, 
and test our ability as an organization to remediate. It's a great way to start if you have a level zero maturity application security program in your company, which many people still have, especially in the small business world. And so here's query parameterization in .NET. Um, this is uh, C sharp, uh, C sharp, C sharp ish. And so we have untrusted input, our text box and our password. We're using a bind command to bind it into the query. And we have our placeholders, password, name, uh, password and name, where the untrusted input will land in the query. So once you code like this, you're done. You don't have to worry about SQL injection. Um, underneath the hood of .NET, it will escape each parameter uh, properly for you in the right context. Here we have query parameterization in Java. We have the prepared statement class. And there are three major pieces to this. Number one, we have question marks in the query, which are placeholders. And number two, we have untrusted data in the set string functions that bind into that untrusted slot. SQL injection goes away when you code like this. How difficult is this? Programmers, how difficult of a concept is this? This is trivial. What about HQL? Anybody here work with an object query language at all? So HQL, if you're doing heavy duty programming for a large enterprise in Java, you're probably using HQL in some way. And you can even have object query injection. In this case, it's hibernate query language injection. The defense is the same. You have the placeholder, emp ID. You, you have the binding statement, which takes this untrusted input and binds it into that placeholder. Underneath the hood, the JDPC driver does proper escaping. This problem goes away. We have to code like this. So we have Ruby on Rails. <coughs> Yo's favorite language. So, so, just so uh, Ruby on Rails allows you to build very complex applications in under a day. It's a very simple framework that has a lot of pre-built components. So this is the only case I know of in history where a programming language had a query parameterization mechanism that broke. So we have, we have the all call, we have a list of parameters, dot all, so please show me you know, all, all the projects where, or all the elements where the ID is in a list of IDs, show me all of them. Well, underneath the hood of this API, Ruby on Rails was using string building to build the query and not proper parameterization. So we saw like three or four platform level injection vulnerabilities against SQL and Ruby on Rails in the last like four or five months. This is a major failure because even when programmers are doing the right thing, they still are injectable even when they use the right APIs. So when you're dealing with Ruby on Rails today, it is, in my opinion, from a security point of view, it's a very insecure framework. Organizations like Twitter who depend upon this have literally forked away from Ruby on Rails and, implement, and basically support their own version of it in order to be successful. And uh, so when you have a framework with, with, with poor security like this, your job becomes not just programming successfully and programming securely, but doing uh, framework management. When a bug comes out that shows your APIs are insecure, you gotta patch fast. And that can be very difficult if you're not in an agile environment. Cold Fusion, anybody here using Cold Fusion? Absolutely no one, and you're probably glad you don't. Even old languages like Cold Fusion have parameterization built in. Anybody here still work with Perl? Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand proudly and proud. Perl, yeah. I can't even read any of my older Perl, but I still am proud I write in it. And even Perl, was Larry Wall, right? Written by an English major? Oh, anyways, we'll talk more about that later. Even Perl has a very robust query parameterization API. In my mind, Perl's like job security. Most, I used to write Perl like 18 years ago. No one can maintain it. They still call me once in a while to fix a few things. It's like great job security because nobody can read your Perl code. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Laugh, it's a joke, all right, all right. But there's a, there's, some, there's a hope for the future. Your PhDs, your hope for the future. And this kind of framework security thinking 
is also hope for a better future in the world of application security. Here we have an example of .NET's link for SQL. Has anybody heard of this abstraction before or this library? Now, link is so important. Again, link has its own problems, but the concept here is crucial. What link does, it says, look, map a bunch of database tables to certain objects, step one. And then step two, you can just build a query like this. Valid users from user in the user profile where user login is this untrusted login and the password is this untrusted password. But this is secure. This is secure from SQL injection. Once you build the link abstraction, underneath the hood of link, it automatically parameterizes for you. So as a programmer, you just need to use link for SQL, and it automatically makes your injection go away. And it has a fairly robust history around this as well. Now, link, has, it's a meta language. It has its own problems. It's the concept of giving programmers a framework-based construct that's auto-protecting against injection this is the future of application security. If we can't bake more of these constructs into the framework, we're not going to be able to scale this knowledge to the whole world. Of, there's about 20 million Java programmers around the world right now that we have to influence. Frank, are you ready? You're up. Nothing more fun than a Monday morning code review session. Don't you agree, Bart? He's like, you're crazy. <laughs> So anyone, let's do some code review. What do you see? <laughs> code review, spot the vulnerabilities. Somewhere in here, there's a, a major security hole in this code. You tell me. Where? All right, Thomas, what you got? Uh, I'm sorry? There, there's a SQL injection. Where? Without looking any further, we see a function that has string input that lands in the middle of a query with no parameterization. This is classic SQL injection. Even if there was some defense up, up up the chain that did some kind of protection, I still call this a major vulnerability in a low-level API. This should be using a parameterization, a parameterized API, and binding of, of individual inputs into that query. What else did you see? I saw that they're not checking whether it's a get or a post. They're not checking whether the parameters are coming. Oh, no, no, no. Right here, it's get. It's do get. Okay. So you're right. In Java, do get is always receiving a get request. So you're, so you're even more brilliant than you are. You're exactly correct. It's, a, it's just a get. What else? One more? Reflective cross-site scripting. It, it's uh, yep, yeah, reflective cross-site scripting. What line? Um, uh, the output line. Exactly. The last line in do get is uh, they're writing raw bytes. So it's reflective cross-site scripting. This is what? This is 15 lines of code or so in just a few minutes, and you found most of them. This is perfect. When you start getting into code review, you start seeing these, like, ever, ever watch The Matrix? Everyone ever watch The Matrix? The movie The Matrix. If you haven't seen it, you must go now and go see it. There's one scene in The Matrix where one of the guys is looking at this, this stream of, of, like, binary data. And he's like, blonde, redhead, brunette. I can just see into The Matrix. When you start doing a lot of code review, you just start seeing these things like look in the matrix. SQL injection, cross site request forgery, bad crypto, bad hard coded key. You start seeing these things. And I, I'm a big fan of code review. And, and, and uh, it's a lost art in the world of computer science and professional programming 10 years ago. We used to do code review as a team all the time. And that art is starting to fade. Less companies do that. So I encourage you as a team, Friday afternoon, let's be honest. How many of you are professional programmers? And what are you doing about 3 to 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, normally? Besides, you know, I'm sorry? Compiling the weekly sprint. <laughs> He's a real worker. Uh, overall, when I look at productivity metrics, very few programmers are checking code in Friday after 3 o'clock. In my own teams in the past, we would make Friday 3 to 5 o'clock 
or whatever the proper last few hours of Friday, group code review. We would all take turns showing important code for the team and community to, to analyze together. Usually it's a very effective technique. I encourage you to do it. A lot of big benefits of that, but it's a lost art. We have command injection. That's when untrusted data drives an operating system command. And here's some more information on command and different kinds of injection. We're going to publish these slides to the SEC App Dev website. We have LDAP injection. We have SQL injection, of course. We have command injection. And here's more information for your further study. This is the number one risk to any web application. Those of you who are security professionals in this space, it's critical you have a good grasp of this knowledge and spread it around. All right, next, secure password storage. This is the theory of where we're at today around storing a password. Let me ask you first, though. How should we not store a password? As a developer, you're on the server building your web application or web service. What are some bad ways to store a password? Plain text. That's pretty bad. What, what, what's another bad way to store a password? I'm sorry? Unsalted hashes. Like, wait a second. MD5? The whole purpose of MD5 was for password storage. Why is that bad? Because they have rainbow tables, you can just look up what is the How big are rainbow tables now? Up to like 12, 13 characters. So let's take a step back. So the recommendation we used to give as an industry is to use a hashing algorithm like MD5 to store a password because it's only one way. That's back in an era where, you know, one gigabyte was prohibitively expensive. How, how tough is it for you to get access to 100 terabytes to play with today? Is that that expensive, really? I, I say it's not, especially in the world of cloud-based services. So you, as a developer, you can go and just write a, write a simple function to walk through every possible password up to 12 passwords. A simple looping of every possible byte sequence. Trivial to write that. And then you can save the hash value and do the hash and put the hash value of every password up to about 12, pa 12 character passwords in a database. Now you have a database of all hashes for all passwords up to, up to a certain length. This is called a rainbow table. And uh, I'll get back to this in a second. And, we, and the British do some things right. So we have md5decryptor.co.uk. We have md5crack.com. These are online MD5 free cracking services. Very powerful. These services have even cracked 31 character passwords because there was a, a hack by LinkedIn and there was a, uh, a 31 character password that some Russian, ha Russian hacking organization cracked because the user was using a Bible quote for their password and some Russian hacker took every Bible quote and made a hash entry for it. This is a specialized hash table for larger passwords and they won. They were able to crack one incredibly large password. Very interesting, I think. So we have online cracking services that are free. And so let's go back to the theory of password storage. We, yes? Because it's getting recorded, I have, I have a remark to do. Even the one with the Bible was a dictionary attack. I'm sorry? Please, please go, no, go ahead. Salty hashes helps against dictionary attacks or against, against uh, exhaustive password search attacks where you use printable characters or so. But rainbow table, they, they attack hashes at a lower level where they take any possible binary inputs and, and so on. So I don't think the salt is meant to protect against the rainbow table. The point I'm trying to make is if you capture the salt, you're totally right, Thomas, but if you capture the salt and the hash value and you know the algorithm being used, that salt only helps you so much because the attacker can take that salt, generate their own, ran, ran, their own a rainbow table for that specific salt in a very short amount of time. Because it, it, there's, uh, especially when you're using SHA-1 or SHA-2, those hashing functions are so incredibly fast that salting alone is not enough. In fact, we see, we see like, uh, uh, we, have, we have an example in the news of a very poorly, of a, very, of a salt only mechanism with no work factor. And I'm trying to preach three different things. It should be verifiable only, that's one way. It sh we should add entropy into it to avoid uh, standard rainbow tables, that's assault, and we should be slowing down the algorithm with the work factor. Please, I, I, I encourage criticism. Go ahead, Thomas. I agree that salts were invented to make cracking passwords harder, 
but their purpose, if I remember correctly, from the beginning was just to deny the attacker the advantage of pre-computation. So now the attacker can't come to your server with a lot of work, homework done, and as soon as they see your hash, revert it like this. Exactly. A rainbow table is a pre-computed list of a rainbow, my understanding is a rainbow table is a pre-computed list of, of passwords and their pre-computed hash value. So when we, do get, when we do get inside the server and see those hashes, we can do one quick lookup to uncover the password. Is that fair? Can I just say before we discuss <laughs> this topic further, which is a, clearly an important topic, but um, on, um, uh, is it on Wednesday? Uh, no, on Thursday. John is using precisely this problem as a case study for his threat modeling uh, and secure design workshop. So can I suggest that? Let's take it there. That, uh, it's a good thing. And this is the, just one last note. This is the state of the art in terms of what people talk about. John, dis, John Stephen is, disagrees with this strongly because when you use these mechanisms of salting and a work factor, you add a huge cost to your own server you begin to have a lot of CPU cycles that become very expensive at scale. Try adding a big work fat, and salting alone is not enough. Because if I get your salt, I can build my own, I can build my own, whatever you want to call it. I'll call it a, a, a custom rainbow table for that specific salt with ease. Because I have a GPU cracker or a cloud service. And so that salt alone is enough. But if I add a work factor, I slow things down and I'm taking that hit. And, and if I'm like a major bank, that little slowing factor becomes incredibly expensive. I need, I need rooms full of servers to handle just password hashing, and that doesn't work either. So John's going to talk about using more, more tried and true crypto, like an HMAC. Uh, you, if, if you have proper key storage, maybe you should avoid this kind of slowing factor and look at you know, more tr traditional crypto to handle password storage. And I agree with, if you have good key management, I'm a fan of that. But I think we want to, we, let's table the conversation. John Stephen is, is going to talk about this in his threat modeling section. I'm going to be there. I'm very, he's really trying to uh, um, change the industry's perspective on this very important topic. So moving on. So let me just jump ahead here. And this is again today, we're re we tend to recommend Bcrypt or Scrypt. So we have Bcrypt, which has its own work factor and its own salt built into it. And you can control the work factor to make it slower on purpose, to make um, offline computation more difficult. We also have Scrypt, which is a re relatively new algorithm that also takes up a lot of memory if you, if you wanted to, to make even mass parallelization attacks difficult as well. John can talk about this in great detail, so I'm gonna, I'll move on. What about forgot password? This is another critical control that I see done incorrectly a lot, I dare say. So for forgot password, what, what are some common ways that you see programmers implement the forgot password function? So you go to a website, you forgot your password, you click forgot password, what's the workflow in most websites from then, on, from then there on out? Yeah, so what if the web service, what if a website sends you the password over email? What does that mean about how they're storing their password? Not necessarily in the clear, but at least it's reversible. And I think that's bad for password storage for the most part. But you're, you're right on. What if someone emails you a link? Click this link and you can reset your password. How secure of a transport mechanism is, uh, is email? It's not. Most major banks will not send you any sensitive information over email anymore. They stopped doing that like five plus years ago because uh, they usually say, here's an email, please call the number on the back of your credit card, or please log in and check your account. Because they don't want to, they don't reveal the information over email anymore because it's a plain text protocol. So when you send a password reset link over email, that's just not a secure way. It's, it's a bad transport of a sensitive link. So I recommend what a lot of US banks are doing, what I've seen uh, major sites like Facebook, uh, other sites move to mechanisms of this nature. So number one, ask for identity questions. Number two, ask for a security question answer. Number three, uh, send a token to that user out of band. And then three, make them plug in that, that, uh, that random token that you just sent them to complete the cycle. Let me go over this one more time. So step one would be to ask the user what their name is, 
what their username is, what their account number is, and maybe what their date of birth or email is, depending on what country you're in, it's legal or not. And then uh, if that's been done successful, then uh, ask them a security question. So security questions are all bad, or I'm sorry, there's no such thing as a great security question. At best, you have a good security question. Most of them are just bad. And so uh, the security question is not a password. It's just another step in the forgot password life cycle. And there are a couple different guides around choosing good security questions for your consumer services. And these are uh, the goodsecuritysquestions.com is one site. There's also the OWASP cheat sheet on secure, secure question choice some resources to consider. So again, identity questions, secure, uh, answer the security question, then send them a token out of band over SMS or over email, or maybe you have a, a thick client, a, a mobile application that drives this token. Most banks do SMS these days. And then verify that code in the same web session and then let the user reset their password. This is basically simulating multi-factor authentication. And this is my big conjecture here is, MFA for the win, multi-factor authentication radically increases the security of your login page, of your, uh, uh, multi-factor authentication radically increases the security of your authentication, and uh, it's becoming much easier to develop in the modern era. Most people have mobile phones now, we don't need to mail them devices, um, and once you do multi-factor authentication, the need to store passwords in a radically secure fashion is much less important. The need to have these uh, you know, complicated password workflows is less important because it's just one factor. So especially as we enter this new era of web development, I think multi-factor authentication is a requirement for good secure design and good secure applications. And maybe it's disabled by default, but it should be available. Most every bank in the US is multi-factor now. Um, Facebook has multi-factor now. Um, who else has got multi-factor? These Twitter is working on multi-factor. Um, most stock trading companies and sites have multi-factor now. So who was one of the first consumer services to offer multi-factor to tens of millions of users? Who was the first one out there to do it? No, Google has multi-factor. They were late to the game. In fact, what, what I like a quick note. Google's multi-factor, I think, is, is very is excellent. They actually give you a kit to use their multi-factor system in your own website. So other companies like Dropbox, instead of building their own multi-factor mechanism, instead they, uh, instead they uh, implemented Google's multi-factor for Dropbox. That's a reasonable choice for consumer services. So who was the first out there in the consumer space? Online What's that? Online gaming. Which, one, which company? World yeah, World of Warcraft. Who said, who said that? High five, that's exactly right. But you, you play World of Warcraft? Did you used to? Come on, you can admit to it. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. You better now though, or? <sighs> better now? Okay. <laughs> so he's exactly right. Blizzard, like four and a half years ago, implemented multi-factor authentication to protect your magic user and his fireball wand and his long sword plus three of dragon slang, right? So if you're gonna protect your magic user with multi-factor authentication, you probably want to protect your multi-billion dollar financial organization and so on with multi-factor. Passwords are dead. This is a key control that we have to consider early on in our software development lifecycle for applications. It radically increases the security of your front gates. How much time do I have, by the way? Yo? Um, Excellent charge. Why is this character? Another kind of injection. Let's talk about client-side injection otherwise known as JavaScript injection, otherwise misnamed terribly as cross-site scripting. There's nothing cross-site about cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is implanting attacks in your website or in a URL. It's not cross-site. So that aside, JavaScript injection, what does your browser do when it sees this character in the response? It's the beginning of a tag, like a script tag, or some tag that can have JavaScript built into it. This, this is a character that's um, necessary for many kinds of cross-site scripting attacks. 
how do I render this character in a browser in a safe fashion so it won't start a new tag but still displays on screen like that? So you're a, wait a second, you're a manager, you're a CISO, supposed to have pointy hair and make and do budgets and you know the answer and the programmers don't. So you, right here, high five. That's the perfect answer, I'm just kidding. So he's exactly correct. It's called escaping. So we want to we want to do this on page ampersand lt semicolon. This is an HTML entity. This is a visual only representation of a very dangerous character, the less than character. So we want to make sure that before in our user interface, when we're displaying, when we are displaying um, potentially malicious input, we want to do output encoding to take a potential attack and convert it to a safe form. This is output encoding or escaping, one of the most important defenses to stop injection. So here we have a series of potentially dangerous characters on the left, and these are the different encoding mechanisms that are necessary to render it in a safe fashion. This is the heart of not just JavaScript injection protection, this is the heart of SQL injection protection and any kind of, any kind of injection. We're converting untrusted data into a form that has been neutralized or sanitized or escaped to be a, a, a safe context, a display only context. This is a really important concept. And so cross-site scripting, there's all kinds of dangerous things we can do with cross-site scripting. Who has heard of cross-site scripting before? So this is when the attacker submits input into your web application that gets stored in some way or is on the URL or deep in JavaScript where another user of the system when viewing a page will see that untrusted input and cause it to execute malicious JavaScript. We can steal the user session, we can modify the page, we can redirect the user, modify any part of the client in the face of cross-site scripting. And so here's an anatomy of a real attack. A lot of security testers will show an alert to prove that they can conduct an attack. And those of you who are testers, I recommend you never do that. If you're going to show a developer cross-site scripting, hit them hard. Show them a real attack that actually does damage, in dev, preferably. Um, the what does the first attack do? Suppose you have your website. Your website is lamps.com. He sells lamps. They're actually, that's a real site, so we'll call it um, Bart's speciallamps.com and you have to log in to see the lamps and now suppose you have a chat area lamp lovers chat area for people who just love lamps and we're chatting we log in we're chatting about the lamps are you with are you with me on the lamps good so then i submit this attack into the forum and then you read my message what happens remember we're on the forum together i submit this attack to the forum you read my message you're logged in bart and this JavaScript executes, what happens? You can phone a friend. I don't, I don't mean to pick on you. Any, anyone. What does this attack do? Anyone but Thomas. Walk, walk us through it, though. Walk us through this attack. Um, so, Bar's computer, Bar's uh, browser, Exactly. So when the attack, la thank you very much. When the attack, la uh, when the attack launches in Bart's browser, it grabs document.cookie from his browser for the site he's looking at right now, BartSpecialLamps.com. So that we now have the cookie of his session ID in a variable, basically, and we add it to a URL at the time of him looking at it in his computer while looking at his, the, his site. That cookie is then attached to a URL, and then window.location just redirects the whole page to my evil site, evilevilgym.com, and the cookie to speciallamps.com is attached. I have that session cookie. I then go log into Lamps myself, replace my session ID with Bart's, and I, am now, I now am Bart. I am now logged in and authenticated as Bart. That's called a session theft cross-site scripting attack. What's the bottom attack do? Real simple. You're up again. Go ahead. What, what, is this, what does this attack here do? It shows the page with the uh, blinking, uh, I don't know, some 90s text. 
Blink tag is by far the most important tag in the web. <laughs> Not many people agree with me on that. So I, I had a manager, um, when I was at MySpace, we kind of gave each other a hard time. So I had a manager who hated the Blink tag, and I used it a lot just to mess with them. So I put like a random, and we were allowed to do this, I put a random sleep in the code that would make the whole page blink every like thousands requests. So for, to this day, I think that code's still in there, sorry. Remo remove, Sam, remove this part, don't. <laughs> remove this for the audience only, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> So here we have a simple page defacement kind of attack. And the problem is we need a different kind of encoding or validation, or we, or we need to avoid APIs based on the context of display of untrusted data. This is a really complex problem. I'm going to talk about this a lot more in depth in the cross site scripting section later on in our course. I'll go through it fast. We have to do basic HTML entity encoding in this context. We have to do a more advanced attribute encoding encoding even spaces and other characters in this context, a value. We want to do URL encoding in this context when we put untrusted data into a potential link. We want to do, we want to do uh, full URL validation, check if there's no malware in this URL, and then attribute and code in this context. We want to avoid this altogether because of old IE browsers or do strict validation and CSS hex encoding. We want to do JavaScript hex encoding in this context. We want to parse JSON in a proper, secure way. And most people will do eval to parse JSON, which is uh, dangerous. It will execute that JSON. And there's some other libraries I'm going to talk about that are really production quality. Um, one of the, the stresses we've had at OWASP is we've had security professionals build a lot of tools for developers that were good in concept and good ideas that just didn't work in production, didn't work in the real world. I've gone out as an OWASP uh, volunteer and sought out like PhD compiler theory software engineers who, who understood how parsers worked in the browser itself. Real heavy duty control thinkers to build more production quality encoders for Java. So I recommend in, in my security API, I recommend the OWASP Java encoder project. It's a simple drop in no dependency jar file ultra high performance. I've never seen an encoder ever with better performance at scale than this. Written by, again, a PhD compiler theory student. So I joke, but that's who I go in. When I need real code built, the toughest code, the absolute most challenging code I can think of, who do I go to? I go to the PhDs. Yeah. So don't you forgive me a little bit now? A little, little bit? <laughs> this is redesigned for performance, and it's a different set of contexts. These are contexts that are specific to how the browser renders HTML, so there's a lot more detail in this encoder. It's the only production quality coder I know of, written by Jeff Ikonowski. Um, it's real straightforward to use it. Here's an example of his encoding in play in a, web, in a Java server page. Encode for HTML attribute. Oh, come on. Max. Encode for HTML content. Encode for JavaScript attribute or encode for JavaScript block message, real detailed API, super high performance, stops cross-site scripting in many contexts. We also have the Java HTML sanitizer project. Anybody here use Tiny MCE in their work? Tiny M one, two, Tiny MCE is a rich text editor on the web. It replaces text areas with the full Word document editor, basically. It submits untrusted data as HTML. You can't encode this, otherwise it will stop rendering. So you need a policy. You need some kind of policy that reduces what HTML will go through your filter so only safe HTML will pass through your gate here. So um, I recommend the OWASP HTML sanitizer project. OWASP used to have a project called anti sammy It was written by security guys, and it really was tough to use in production at great scale. So as a, as a respectful counterpoint to that very good project, Michael Samuel, who's one of the lead developers for the Google's application security team, he has a what? He has a PhD. PhD. Yes, he does. So I went and got him, and he was kind enough to donate this amazing high-performance code that sanitizes untrusted HTML in a Google-scale kind of way and with, with a very simple policy editor. I'm a big fan of this project. This is what works in the real world, in my opinion. And so and it's real straightforward to use. You set a policy, where in this case he's allowing an A tag, HTTPS only, a href tags only, 
No relative links allowed. Build it, sanitize it, and whatever comes out here is safe to render on a web page. Really critical component for one of the toughest areas of XSS defense. In the world of PHP, we have the PHP HTML sanitizer project. In the world of .NET, we have the anti-XSS library get safe HTML function. And in Java, there's not much out there. There's anti-SAMI and there's this project, which, and then there's JSOUP. JSOUP does DOM-based parsing, very slow. So this is SACS-based parsing written from scratch. So I recommend anti-SAMI or, or this project for HTML sanitization, a key component for XSS defense. What about JSON? There is no JSON sanitizer out there. So this is another donation from Google to OWASP, another high performance sanitizer. It uses Postel's principle and saying, be conservative in what you do and be liberal in what you accept from others. I tend to live life the opposite. That's a further conversation, but for code, I'm all about this. What this says is it's like, I'm building this tool so that before I send JSON to the browser, I'm going to do a strict sanitizer run on that JSON before it hits the browser. And if I do that sanitization on the way out, then I can eval JSON safely in a high performance way. The other use for the OWASP JSON sanitizer is when the browser submits potentially untrusted JSON to the server, this sanitizer will remove obvious attacks and, and convert even bad JSON into fully compliant and trusted JSON. So this is another key component necessary for secure coding. Again, it wasn't written by a security guy who had some good ideas, no offense. It was written by a professional programmer who has one of the biggest scalability problems in the world and, and he, when bugs arrive, he fixes them in 24 hours. So active project, actively supported, high performance, works in the real world, written by a software and security expert. We need more of this to win, big time. And so a few more, and so here we have that in use, real simple, let me jump ahead here. How about jQuery? We use this a lot when we're rendering, on, when we're doing advanced user interface work. Who here uses jQuery in their coding? All the time. And so jQuery itself is very insecure from a cross site scripting point of view. When you use jQuery element.txt, that's a safe way of using jQuery. When you do element.html, Whatever hits there renders. So if JavaScript hits the .html function, it will execute in the browser. So we want to make sure we use jQuery in a safe way. This is a list of functions that are and are not safe in jQuery. This is a research done by Dave Wickers over at Aspect, did a lot of this work. Let me use the slides. Go Dave. And uh, we also have content security policy, which we'll talk about in the course as well. This is now not a library. This is a standard that says inline I'm sorry, externalize all your JavaScript, number one. How many of you put your, all of your JavaScript, all of it, in a separate JS file forevermore? Who's like that? Come on, someone. Good. One. <laughs> Yo? Good Where's your code? I want to see it. <laughs> so uh, the, we've been telling developers for about a decade to take all of your JavaScript and put it in a separate JS file and then use binding events. It's a more high performance way to code. I've made, yo, know, jokes aside, I've, I've inlined JavaScript all the time. So I'm, I'm a sinner here as well. But to use content security policy, if you push all of your script to a separate JS file, you can then set a content security policy that stops any JavaScript that, try, that sneaks into your application. And so we'll talk about this more later on in the course. I will not write inline JavaScript. I will not like, yes, yes, keep going, keep going. One of my, uh, I was a consultant for a company and they said, Jim, you must externalize your JavaScript. And I didn't do it once after I promised to. So he, in front of the class, in front of the, uh, our office, I had to write on the wall like a hundred times. I will not, I did it for fun, whatever. I don't do it anymore. <laughs> I learned my lesson. And uh, everybody was watching and cat calling me while I did it. So I, I learned in the, by trial by fire, never do it again. So we can, we can give, we can, facilitate a session like that for you if you like, yo. <laughs> we see uh, Twitter is a big user of content security policy. Neil Matatal is one of the head researchers at Twitter who does this. Um, I, I watched the W3C debate this right now. Adam Barth and a lot of other real senior web thinkers are working on this standard. It's the future of real rigorous XSS defense in the browser. 
This will matter in two or three years. So something to keep your eye on and study right now. Here's a couple examples of it in play. One last thing before we're done. Click jacking. Just, this is just for fun. This is not a major risk. It's big enough. I worry about it. This is a fun one. Then we're done. So when you see this web page, what do you think right away? What's that? Think, yeah, I want to play some super fun games. Are you with me? When I see this, I'm like, wow, this is awesome. I can't wait to play super fun games. Am I alone here? Ken. Are you with me, Ken? Not really. <laughs> so to play this game, we have to come up here and do one player and start game. I need some. Thomas, you're tall, right? Can I, can I borrow you for a second? Come up. You're taller than I am. I'm short. So I need, I need, a, I need some click helping. So what we can do as the attacker is we can embed an evil iframe on the page here that loads Gmail. Stand by. You ready? Get ready. Get ready. So what we can do as an evil attacker, I have my evil, evil gym website, and I'm going to embed a style tag which forces an opacity on the frame and then make it at the, and position it in a certain way. And so here I am loading mail.google.com in a frame but I'm making that frame transparent with opacity. Opacity means it's not visible, but it's still clickable. So let's cl we do a click jacking. So let's do confessions. Who here is currently logged into Gmail in their browser? So this is, this is, so you may be vulnerable to this kind of attack. Let's do it. So this is how we would load the content evilly in the iframe. To complete the attack, we would make this iframe almost, almost ready. Hang tight. To, <laughs> you need to jump. Oh, no, um, where's the where's the projector? It's up there. It's up here. Oh, that's gonna be tough. <laughs> I'll take my. Are you, are you ready? Are you, give it give it a try. One player, go uh, higher, higher, and say click. Click. Oh, select all. Thomas, you ready? Start game. Click. Nice shot. Delete. That's click jacking. Click jacking is with an e. Thomas, thank you, thank you very much. So clickjacking is when you put up a, a, an evil, a, a good page that the user's already logged into that you're trying to target, and you have an evil, and you make it transparent, and you trick the user into clicking on certain parts in the page. Again, this is an example of the, of the evil code used. We're loading Gmail, we're loading Gmail the inbox. We're, we're adding this iframe with a very specific position, with absolute positioning, so it's on top. We also give it a certain opacity so it's not visible and trick the user into clicking on certain locations within the page. This is click jacking. We stop this by doing uh, frame breaking. We disallow other websites to frame our site. That's the, the goal here. So there's standards that most browsers honor. X frame option deny. This is in your response. This tells a browser, do not let anybody else frame me in any other way. Um, you can also say X frame option, same origin. This is saying basically uh, only my domain can frame this other site. Or there's also X frame option allow from X, which allows other third parties to frame as well. Another interesting attack, I think. Yes, Ken. Uh, aren't those at the discretion of the browser? Though? Yeah, the browser needs to support it. Luckily, we're at about 95% penetration now. There is manual JavaScript frame breaking code, which I'll talk about in the XSS section. But this is the this is the minimal defense necessary. And again, to your point, the browser has to support this particular header for it to work. And luckily, Firefox is supported from Firefox 4. IE is supported for quite a while as well. It's, it's hit enough penetration where I tend to only talk about this now. I will bring up manual frame breaking, though. And I think we're, I'll talk about uh, access. Oh, yes, sir. Don't browsers also, by default, defend against this now? I think uh, Internet Explorer may be putting one of those bars where this code is doing something fishy, or if not, also in Firefox with uh, no script or something. I've, I've been protected against this when I was testing it. By default, no. You need to have the no script plugin, or implement some additional plugin, or change the settings in your browser, by, or, uh, or the, you have to enable this filter in your response as well. And so by default, it tends to not be protected. Uh, but the browser does support the different defensive standards very well today that will stop this. If you're a security guy running no script, of course you're going to stop it. It has clear click protection built in where transparent frames are forced to be visible to make it harder to attack you with that and other defenses. But you're right, there are plugins that stop this 
That, that doesn't scale very well, though, for everyone. So I'm going to talk about access control design later on. I'm worried about hard coding roles like this. I'm a big fan of Apache Shiro, which I'll talk about later on. Apache Shiro is, a, um, is so important because, there it is, because it, it doesn't do role-based access. It does role-based access control underneath the hood, but the actual code it encourages is to verify the activity, the permission, not the entitlements, not the policy of the user. So this is a critical, it's not even like role-based access control versus other methods. It's just design of where, how you imply enforcement and code. Critical that we do it in an activity permission-based way and Apache Shiro is the best at this in the Java world today. I'm done. Thank you so much for being here, for caring about software security. The best is yet to come. Coffee up, everyone. Cheers.